um, uh, when you asked if if I would do this, of course, I said yes immediately. And then I started thinking about how many things there are to say here. Let me just say now before I launch into my particular more or less prepared remarks um, that one of the things my teacher was was Hannah Arendt. Uh, um, and I will talk about her soon. Um, she's a was a philosopher, a political philosopher, a thinker, an intellectual who thought publicly. It was one of her modes of action was to think publicly. She spoke, she wrote, she was out and about. Um, and she always made many people think. And one of the things she says in one of her most important pieces um, is that when things are at their worst, thinkers who may often prefer solitude are drawn out and become political because who they are and what they do is very political when what's happening is minds are being closed down. We talk a lot about minds being divided these days, separated, locked into ideologies. Um, overall, the, I would say there's something even more profound to watch out for, of course, which is when minds are being controlled and shut down. Divided is bad. Shut down, isolated. That's a step beyond. Um, and thinkers, artists, um, those who enliven minds become dangerous to regimes um, and heroes to those who are trying to keep regimes from setting in. Um, they certainly kept us going during COVID, didn't they? We had people to connect with and read and so forth. Um, the proclaimed subject of the talk um, put together the question of what is thinking and why is it important with why, how, how might it matter politically and democratically? I've just said a fair amount about why and how it matters politically um, and publicly. The next thing to do, I think, to be sure that we are um, in communication, which is crucial through all of this, uh, if we stay in our in our usual sets of meanings, then we're not thinking together. Of course, we want to reach out and hear different things. Um, I should define thinking, which of course can't really be done. But since we're talking about thinking, let me say what I want to be meaning by it, uh, which is something actually quite specific. Thinking overall is an activity of our life. It is it, it is our life when we're a brain dead we're dead um literally <laughs> that's one of the that's the criteria that's the criterion for it thinking is not only something that happens as people like to say sort of up here or up here we're embodied minds it is an act activity of sensing feeling pleasuring having emotional responses all the way to sitting in silently by yourself and doing some deductive analysis or some fancy interpretation that's wonderful and elaborated. Um, and our bodies react and participate uh, variously in these, in these activities. Um, to have a feeling is also to be conscious. To be conscious is to be ready to have a thought. If we were unaware of our feeling, we wouldn't have a feeling. Um, same with pain. So it's a, it's a holistic thing. So it is, it is huge. It is what we are. We're conscious creators and creatures of meanings. Um, we're not, we don't have things programming us. We, we make meanings all the time and adjust them, trying to make sense of our, of our world. So we are really crucially in thinking creatures. Um, and one of the things that drives me most crazy and worries me most seems to me one of the biggest lies of all times is when people say, you know, you think too much. I don't live in a world where people think too much. Quite the contrary. I, I sort of wish I did, actually. Um, it's kind of like the saying, power corrupts. Powerlessness also corrupts. And power can, in fact, be empowerment. I think we have to watch out for these kind of banal reflex statements. Um, we need to reclaim our minds fully and not automatically and not as prepackaged for us, not as trained, um, but as educated, invited out, participatory, communicating the way we are with others and with ourselves consciously. Um, 
can't specify all the modes of thinking, of course, because it is an activity of, of our of our life. Um, so I won't even I won't even try. But I will tell you that the specific kind of thinking I'm most interested in, and then I'm going to say something about more in relation to uh, politics and living together in our world, politics in the rich sense, I don't mean parties and issues specifically, I mean public life together where we decide um, if we have any freedom, where we decide how we will live together. Um, in the broadest sense, public life of action with and among others. Um, the thinking I am most specifically referring to is I sometimes do you do it with a capital T and um, all the other modes of thinking, which are infinite, we'll never finish specifying them. Um, you can't do a list of all that it means to be human. I'm writing a book about what it means to be human right now. No, no, cannot specify. <laughs> we can reflect, we can think, we cannot specify. Thinking, we can't do, we can't list all the different modes of thinking. We can it's useful to name some and pay attention to them, but we won't ever be done. And one reason will never be done in addition to what I've been saying um, is because what this capital T thinking, not the lots of little T thinkings, is um, our capacity to think about our own thinking even, to be self-aware, to be conscious, conscientia, to know with, so that we don't just straight ahead know, like input just comes in and we have channels that receive it and respond, um, we can think about that. We can always get off the train. We can get off a one at our own one-track mind. We can always stop and say, what's that? Um, and then say, why did I say, what's that? And keep going almost infinite, infinite regress. Um, that gap between who we are, how we are, how we're thinking, I think that's the location of human freedom. That's where we become able to make choice. That's where it opens to be aware and therefore to make choice. It's also how conscience arises, of course. If we're not aware, if we're not able to think about and with ourselves and ourselves acting in the world and others, if we're not aware, we can't have conscience. Conscience arises from consciousness. Um, and it's given space and practice and fresh air <laughs> Um, the more we think and practice that reflexivity. So one of the reasons we can't specify all the kinds of thinking is because the minute we specify one, thinking comes along and says, yeah, but what about? And does that mean this? And so forth. Um, one of the things that um, my teachers, one of my teacher's teachers, the philosopher Martin Heidegger says, um, is that thinking is always out of order. Um, it lays down tracks and never gets anywhere. What Hannah Arendt said about thinking is that it's like Penelope with her weaving, trying to stay free. That's in the Odyssey, for those of you who, who know the Odyssey. Um, she's trying to, never mind why for the moment, she's trying to preserve her freedom and she has to not finish what she's weaving to preserve it. So she weaves all day and at night she unweaves it. <laughs> That's what thinking does. Thinking dissolves certainties. You're thinking when you say, oh, I don't think so, or I said this, and oh, I shouldn't have said that. That's the reflexive capital T thinking. Opens that gap. Um, the Socratic two-in-one is often referred to. Um, questioning, basically. So with that mode of thinking, which is what I'd like to talk about, that's the mode of thinking specifically that is, gets drawn out in times of difficulty and trouble. Um, because when the word, world isn't making sense, when the world is causing trouble, changing dramatically, frightening, whatever, thinkers will get drawn out. All of us who are capable of thinking, which is everybody, capable, doesn't mean we will, but we're capable of it. That's an, the, one of our pre preservative activities. When something happens, odd noise in the apartment building, you go out and you say what happened and you talk to other people and you begin to try and think about what happened. Um, so um, reflexive thinking um, matters most of all in difficult political times and is most lacking and most threatening to the most repressive times. Um, 
to say, so that's part of definition of thinking and part of why it's important always politically. Um, I should also underscore that it's fundamentally democratic. Educated people can be non-thinkers. Um, one of the things the philosopher uh, Whitehead says is there's no greater bore on God's green earth than a merely well-informed person. If you're well-informed, you can know an enormous amount If you and you cannot think about it, step off of it, question it. You can do it within the field. You don't get out of the field and think about it. Um, and all right, for one, was very clear that this is, it has nothing to do with necessarily with, with education. Sometimes education even works against it because people become trained and move into enclosures of mind where they become highly skilled like athletes and they can play tennis with other pro tennis players, but they can't play tennis on the public courts anymore. Um, so it's a complex, <laughs> complex issue, but thinking itself is something everybody is capable of, and it's not sorted out by, uh, you know, elites, education, privilege, et cetera. Um, it's another reason for being interested in it. it is fundamentally democratic. And if we can, the more we practice it, the more people are going to want to be democratic and the better we will be at speaking and thinking together because we'll question each other um, and we'll open up and we'll dissolve certainties and that will allow us to make choices and exercise judgment. Um, we don't run a democracy by bringing in an expert and telling us what to do. We run a democracy by getting together and thinking. Um, which is to say it's not knowledge, it's thinking uh, that's most important. Knowledge is crucial and truth is crucial. Uh, truth is the ground we stand on and the horizon over us. Knowledge gives us information, a commons of the mind, it, the building blocks of our world, very, very important. Thinking is what keeps all of that enlivened, changing, open, um, and practices us in being able to get ready for choices, to make judgment, not just deductions. You can come to back back to that if that if that doesn't make sense. Um, I thought I would then tell you reasonably quickly two stories of thinking instead of trying to lay out any more. <laughs> this is what it means. This is how it works. Um, let me just tell you a couple of stories. People don't tell thinking stories. We tend to think of it as non-narrative, which I think is entirely wrong. I think one of the things we're doing when we put something into a story is thinking about it, trying to make sense. And we, that's one of the forms we can use. We can use other forms, but that's a very common one. Um, what we're doing is making sense of things we're, we're, we're thinking. So let me tell you two thinking stories. Um, the first one is my teacher, Hannah Arendt, um, and the second one is mine. And I don't mean to be equating myself with Hannah Arendt, absolutely do not. Um, but it is an ongoing enfolding story. And um, I like it because it has some sort of coherence and it certainly connects to, to our issues. Um, you may know, some of you may know that, um, I mean, I'm sure everybody has heard of the Holocaust and World War II, the Nazi genocidal program, numbers of people actually that they wish to erase from the earth, the largest and prime group was Jews. Um, their genocidal program was literally to remove from the face of the earth so no more could breed. They, they had all kinds of laws about that. And um, it, a whole race. So there's something wrong with the concept of race to begin with. And then there's this notion of, um, of eugenics. You know, once you have races, which is, is curious and complex. It's a whole other uh, conversation, but we've turned them into uh, divisions, not distinctions. And that's almost always deadly when it comes to kinds of human. Um, they get ranked, usually down from the people who are doing the ranking. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of history of this, and many cultures have it, um, hierarchies of kinds of, of humans. So um, Hannah Arendt was... Jewish, she was uh, highly intellectual, became a philosopher and had extraordinarily pol good political judgment and she got out in time from Germany. Um, 
and I'll skip the rest of the wonderful story, but she, I mean, wonderful, troubling, difficult, but again, time and again, she had extraordinary political judgment, which to me always makes the case for the fact thinking is political because she was primarily a thinker, a superb thinker. And she had very good judgment because she saw what was going on. Um, she didn't get trapped, you know, in the prevailing notions. Um, she came to the United States and shortly, remarkably quickly after the end of the war, she wrote a massive book called Origins of Totalitarianism about a new form of government, totalitarianism that had emerged and what it was, that, how it had been possible and what we need to learn about it um, and what was new about it. Again, that's a thinker task. Um, she had all the categories, but what was happening with uh, the Nazis, as I'm sure you know, with the Holocaust and totalitarianism, um, is that every category we had got shattered. Forms of government, right along with any notion of morality, justice, anything, uh, humanity, <laughs> um, humaneness. So people were just gasping. Nobody, to say it was unthinkable was the thing to say which of course is not safe um, to say the least, but it's fully understandable because we didn't have the categories. So she wrote Origins of Totalitarianism. She then later um, went to cover the trial of a man named Adolf, Adolf Eichmann who had been caught. He was, a lot of the Nazis fled, as you know. Um, some of them went to countries in uh, South America. He had been captured, he brought back for trial for crimes against humanity. Um, and she got herself sent to cover the trial, Hannah Arendt did, um, by the New Yorker. And she sat through the trial and read a, a lot of the documents, lots and lots and lots of them, and sent back papers that were published in the New Yorker and then became a book um, called um, Eichmann in Jerusalem, A Study in the Banality of Evil. I will just tell you now, I'm gonna define banality and evil in, in just a second. Let me tell you, because it's crucial to what I wanna to say too, but uh, it was highly controversial. People were horrified. How could you possibly say there was anything banal about somebody who was called the engineer of the final solution? Eichmann was the man who, with many, many other people working with him, but it was his task to make possible the purposeful, administrative, effective, efficient murder of some six million people. That's a logistical challenge. They needed an engineer. They needed somebody to make the trains run, to make supplies to, the, to build the camps, to do, you, that is a logistical job of the first order. You can't just do that. And that, Eichmann was in charge of that. Um, and she went to the trial, she listened to it. Distill way down, and I will say, what, well, she, what she used to say was that she found herself with a concept as she was listening. And what the concept was, was this banality of evil. Um, now, bracket that for a moment. Let me say what banality is and what evil is, and then I'll just say one more thing, a couple more things about what, what she meant, um, and then we'll go to the next part. Um, Banal, um, not a word that gets used very commonly, although by now the banality of evil, had, which was so shocking and horrifying to people for years and still is to a fair number, um, understandably. Um, it isn't commonly used, but by now banality of evil is itself almost a banality, which is ironic in the extreme. Um, banal basically means ordinary, but with all the life sucked out of it. It's a, you know, been re reduced to a cliche, uh, a thought, a saying, um, an expression, concept that's been reduced to worn coin. You know, there's nothing really on it anymore. People exchange them because they feel good. They get them something. We, we get something from them. Um, we can express all kinds of things with, with them without even having to think. And the recipient doesn't have to either. We, we already know that. It's just banal. It's got no life left to it. Kind of useful, like being, it's like the coin <laughs> um, 
the toll of people who are driving on autopilot. <laughs> we just drop it in the slot and keep going. Those are banalities. Okay, that's the opposite, obviously, of evil, whatever you mean by evil. Um, I will say that I mean, and I believe um, this is fair enough um, to Hannah Arendt, you can never say what she meant because she was a thinker and she, it changed as she continued to think and it was always richer, of course. Um, but in any case, um, speaking for myself, thinking about her, I will say, and the way I've used it since then, evil is very similar, non-theological, I'm not going into any of that. Um, if we say evil when to say bad would be ludicrous. I can't say genocide is a bad thing to do. I can't say Hitler was bad boy. Uh, bad is not big enough. E we say evil when it goes over the top, when we don't know how to categorize it, when we just sort of gaze at it in horror um, and say things like unthinkable. Um, Specific categories, of course, that are being broken are, are is a whole other topic, but certainly a notion of judgment of anything that would be acceptable um, in any kind of just common, decent society. That, that Nothing all that complex um, within the bounds of a rich, reasonably full, um, ordinary life for people not disrupted, not torn to shreds, not violated, uh, just common decency. Evil is so over the top from that that it's extraordinary. Okay, so I, I use it as an as that kind of an extreme. Um, and in, in one way, parallel to what I said when I said truth is a horizon, we don't possess it. it, it it's out there as something that we aspire to and by which we judge even our own truths. Um, it, it's not possessable, it's a horizon. Evil is, I think, similarly a horizon. That's so far too far that we've left meanings of humanity that we're capable of behind, but we apprehend it. It's, it's there, <laughs> it's potential and it has been experienced and it's going on now it's um so that's evil so she was talking about the banality of evil what she meant i'm, I'm going to do this far too quickly what she meant was that she had observed in this man adolf eichmann engineer who was making it possible the murder of this many people um as a pro as a problem logistical problems to be solved um day by day lots of people working with him to do that and he himself, who was doing monstrous, what he was doing was monstrous. It was evil, no question. Monstrous deed and mo making monstrous deeds possible. So it's almost meta monstrous, <laughs> what, he, what he's doing. Absolutely taking nothing away from that at all. What was astounding, although she'd been thinking about it, I know, know for a lot of years from reading her letters and so forth, but here she encountered it um, and it came to mind is that the man himself was pretty much a petty bu bureaucrat. Um, he followed the rules. He wanted things done right. Um, he was greatly honored when his superiors even spoke to him. Um, he was had good marriage, apparently, had, was a good father, apparently, by all reports. Um, he had noble feelings, um, talked about what was good, always in cliched terms always. It just, nothing ever rose above the banal. He had all kinds of categories in his mind already there, and he used them. And she was, he, he himself said at one point to the judge, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sir, I only speak bureaucraties. He was sort of aware of it, there's a little thinking going on there. Um, that's what was striking to her, was the man was shocking in some ways, certainly, um, but not a monster, not evidently a monster, which is what we expect when the deed is that monstrous. I mean, you can look at Hitler speaking and you can say that's a monster. 
know, and those rallies and so forth and uh, white supremacists and so forth. You can say, oh, oh, horrifying. Um, this is somebody sitting there filling out forms and getting things done in ways that do enormous harm and being a good citizen at the same time. Um, and that's what she meant. Um, she did not want to romanticize. Um, there were people doing their jobs and their jobs happened to be carrying out a genocide. So she said the banality of evil, which is still hard to wrap our minds around and does not mean everybody is a little like mine. It does not mean all bureaucracy is horrible. It doesn't mean all administration is horrible. It, mean, it means that was, and this was a person who could work in it and not see it and not step out. People did, of course. He didn't, and many others did not. Does not mean it's all bad. This was. Um, it doesn't mean we're all, all little like minds, as has been said. That's That used to upset Hannah Arendt greatly. But no, no, she would say, I wouldn't do that, and you wouldn't do that. Um, so she asked a question then coming out of that. And her question, which is one that has driven me my whole working life since then, um, was do an inability to think and a radical failure of what we commonly call conscience coincide. Thank you, Thomas. I forgot to ask for that. Wonderful. Um, could you show the other one too from Voltaire since I forgot that one? Those who can make you believe um, absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Hold those two in tension. And there, you're wonderful, Thomas. How about the third one from C.G. Woodson? There would be no lynching if it, did, if it did not start in the classroom. I put those together because of the um, their dense implications for the importance of thinking and therefore also of education and therefore the kinds of things that Brooke and Thomas and you all are being part of, which is to say, if we're thinking in ways that are absurd, ludicrous, horrifying, the horrifying is often ludicrous. Take a look at the dictators if you have some distance from it. Listen to the thought if you have some distance from it. Another long topic. C.G. Woodson, you may know, he was a great uh, African-American educator uh, died in the 1950s, but born in the 1800s, very, very active uh, and very brave, um, and um, startled people by saying, you know, the violence against uh, against Black people um, is deeply rooted in the culture, in the meanings we share, has to do with our thinking, education has to deal with it. So, um, he was quite clear that we had to be working in uh, in our minds and what we think we know like construction of races and so forth, but also much more than that. Um, so that's in line, I think, with what Voltaire was saying, French philosopher from the Enlightenment, 17th, 18th century, um, and Hannah Arendt's question, not thinking coinciding. Um, inability to think and a radical failure of what commonly called conscience coincide. Are we capable of anything if we're not thinking? Um, okay, then my story is that I, Hannah Arendt took me with her when she was talking about her book, which at that point was highly controversial, as I said, and these were searing discussions. She was attacked personally in all kinds of ways and uh, still is in some ways, although she's also revered now. It's an interesting conjunction, not unusual for thinkers. Um, she took me with me and I sat in the back, of course, quietly as a cowed graduate student, but intensely interested. And one day I found myself with a sort of a concept in my relation to all of this, which was, I thought, uh, what about the evil of banality? If she talked about the evil of banality, maybe people would have understood her better or been able to listen to her better. Um, because obviously, <laughs> Evil unto itself is not banal, it's the opposite, it's monstrous, and she knew that. Um, what we're after somewhere in pairing these is what is it about banality 
And you know from the quote you just saw from her, this means thoughtlessness, the worn coins we just exchanged, we're not thinking anymore, banalities. Um, what is it about that that makes possible monstrous acts? Okay, so I, I walked off with that question. I read a dozen plays, I interviewed people, I went from journals to studies to any field, whatever, <laughs> testimonies, uh, all kinds of things, watching for what you can't ever see, which is how people who, who had been involved in what we would call evil acts were thinking about what they did. Um, I can't know that, of course. I think maybe we can glimpse it. Um, people will say things um, and often reflect later and so forth. Anyhow, skipping through all of that, I found myself with the need in particular for a distinction which I want to make. And this is, I suppose, one of the main things that I need to offer by way of thinking about thinking in relation to politics and acting in our own lives too. Um, you've heard it in what I was just saying, which is, um, if we continue to think, to feel, to want, to just be driven towards a notion that monstrous acts require monstrous people, singular, plural, we need a moral equivalency, act and actor. We cannot understand, we literally cannot understand things like genocide, enslavement, massive sexual violations of the most vulnerable, um, tortures, um, child labor, fill it in, the lasting large scale evils, when we get past them, we look at them and we say, oh, this is evil, this is horrible, this is terrible. They prevail for you know, three months with the genocide in Rwanda, sometimes for years, sometimes for decades, some of them for millennia, violation of the most sexual violation of the, of the vulnerable, out there always, look around, <laughs> unfortunately, tragically. So there are some um, I came to call them extensive evils. They last over time. They involve, they, they require a great many people. Eichmann couldn't do it by himself. He had lots of people. Hitler surely couldn't do it by himself. You couldn't enslave people, build an economy on enslavement of people and slave labor with just a few people. Couldn't be done. You have to have a lot of people. It has to be normalized. It has to last. They have to be able to do it over time on a daily basis. Elizabeth? Yes, ma'am. If I may interrupt, uh, what comes to my mind in my lifetime is the child separation policy down at the border, taking children away from their parents yeah. on a large scale done by many yes. people. Yes, exactly. One or two people aren't doing that. And many of the people who are doing it and making it possible in all kinds of ways um aren't filled with hate some are there's i'm sure there's some monsters yeah there always are <laughs> um but many they have a job they've learned to do it some will take pride in it be ambitious want to rise in the ranks by doing it well others will kind of go like this and grit their teeth and do it some will feel they have to because it's their job it becomes a part of that conglomeration of human lives and then it can be done if we don't learn precisely to look at that i mean i'm sorry at one point people, i talked some people got in touch with me to say what do we do about what's happening at the border out there and i said <laughs> uh i don't know but they were going out there and they had all kinds of active sort of thing i just wanted to add to that suggestion that they take seriously that there are people there doing their jobs and that they speak about their jobs and that they might be able to speak also respectfully and carefully and caringly about the difficulty of the job for people. Small thing, not going to stop anything, but one people might, but one aspect of engaging with such horrors is to remind people to all of us get waked up sometimes. Um, I mean, I, I remember thinking, coming to and realizing that should I fail students during the Vietnam War, 
the males at that point, they were going to get drafted. There were ways in which doing my job was being pulled into the system. Um, that's that's it, it. It moves our notion of activism from stopping large things and stopping monsters and monstrosities, which is also true. <laughs> And we can support those who are acting that way. We can send them money. We can do a march. We can do all kinds of things. It doesn't take much. And, and if we're not going to do that ourselves or form an organization ourselves, we can be thoughtful and help all of us think about thoughtful about what we're doing, why and how we're doing it on a daily basis. Because the extensive evils become normalized. They can't last. They can't be done. They work their way into religions. They work their way into philosophies. They work their way into law. Um, the society, plantation owners were thoroughly respectable, et cetera. So when these things are ended, all of that deep implication, that's those skews in our meanings and um, concepts that we've got, knowledge we think is sound but was like the science of race and the science of gender inequality and science is deeply implicated in some of these things as you know um scales of intelligence and so forth sterilizations of the lesser kind science is implicated so is all of knowledge because these that was my first book transforming knowledge <laughs> uh, because these notions have gotten into our meaning system they were normalized Monstrosity, yes. And then we have to keep, I believe, watching exactly for how these things are built into. You don't have to hate. You don't even have to be aware of what you're doing. You don't even have to get a slight kick, you know, from a little meanness. You can mean entirely well. We can, all of us. Because there's that kind of, I mean, there are a lot of systems, as we know, and we live within them. We live within meaning systems, too. And they will carry, of course, the extensive evils in them. Okay, I don't want to run out entirely of time so I can say something about extensive good, because that's important, too. I should say, intensive evil is, you know, a monster doing a monstrous thing. It's over. Everybody's horrified. It's terrible. And it's over. Extensive are the ones like this. You probably already figured that out. Same with extensive good and intensive good. The intensive good is the saints, the people who make us feel like, I can't do that. I wish I could, but I can't. Or I might be able to do it for a week, but I can't keep it up for a lifetime. Um, extensive good would similarly be practices that are um, conscious, aware, thoughtful, attentive to realities, and I always want to say, I think appropriate is one of the high ethical achievements to be appropriate to a reality, to people, to relation. Uh, opposite of that is violative. Maybe even more opposite is to violate it, to make it be something that you've decided it should be. Um, and to do that violatively rather than perhaps by persuasion, whatever. Extensive good. Um, it's like, well, it's an extreme example, but it's for real. And there are other there are other instances I have in the book stories. I'm sure you've seen that there's a, a wonderful book. And I think that now a couple of movies or films, documentaries about the village of Le Chambon. And there are several others up in the mountains of southern France. Um, uh, these were Protestants in Catholic France. They had long been sort of um, outsiders and oppressed on occasion. Um, Protestant Catholic, as you know, has also been bloody. Um, and they had settled in these different communities. They lived their religion deeply. They um, discussed things in the world. Um, they had a pastor that brought in, in Chambon, um, asked them what they thought about things, and they, they resisted when the Nazis occupied France. They were in the South, so they weren't right on the front lines. They took in Jews and helped them across the border into Switzerland. Um, and one of the things that struck me, this is one of the moments when I began to realize I needed this distinction, because this was extensive good, not intensive. They, every one of them, and I've heard this since and encountered it ever since I started 
listening for it. When people have done things that are actually in, in their times and place, kind of extraordinary um, and very brave um, and unquestionably good. Uh, and you say, that was wonderful. You're so wonderful. So heroic, so courageous, it's so good. The typical response is no, I'm, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not. Um, what was I going to do? Slam the door in the face of somebody who's being, who's at risk of dying, who's hungry, who's cold? I'm going to slam the door. That's all I did. Um, and I, I hear that, as I said, I hear that regularly where people just do the obvious thing <laughs> that's right there. I then want to add, oh, yes. Okay, Thomas, I have my other quotes. <laughs> um, one of my favorite ones, and this brings us back to thinking in education and politics. John Dewey, as you know, wrote a book called Democracy in Education. You probably know it's one of his most widely read ones. Um, the last line of democracy in education is interest in learning from all the contexts of life is, is the essential moral interest. Interest, inter-est, interest. I'm connecting, something's awakening. I'm I'm open to something. We're I'm in between. I move into an in-between something. Interest in learning from all. This would wear us out if we did it all the time. But it's a, he's not going to exclude anything categorically. From all the context of life, is the essential moral interest, which also says that. A danger in being moral is not being open, interested in learning. There's a banality of good, too. We can do enormous harm when we think we know what's good and set out to act on it without being attentive to all the context of life, without being present to the reality, without taking pains to also be appropriate to what's, to what's there. Um, it comes together with the notion of um, extensive evil as an opposite. One is you're enclosed in thought, you're doing your job, you're being ambitious, you're following the rules, um, you're thinking about your problems that you're solving, your logistical or whatever problems, you are not paying attention to what you're doing. Um, the story about Eichmann, as you may have heard is that one of the few times he ever saw what was he had made possible it made him sick he fainted he threw up he had never thought what he was doing and um, one of the things Hannah Arendt said about him he never killed anybody he probably couldn't he was doing his job he wasn't participating he wasn't being present to it it's thinking of course is also imagination I said it's all of our abilities. So interestingly, learning from all the contexts lies the central moral interest. And then there's um, Wisława Szyszymborska, the Polish poet who won the Nobel Prize. And that one is a bit harder. Granted in daily speech, when we don't stop to consider every word, we use phrases like the ordinary world, ordinary life, the ordinary course of events. But in the language of poetry, where every word is weighed, nothing is usual or normal, not a single leaf, and above all, not a single existence, not anyone's existence in this world. She also says in her Nobel Prize speech, which this comes from, um, that inspiration is something that comes to many people. It comes to not only to poets, not many people, across categories and forms of life so forth as thinking occurs across inspiration too she says inspiration comes when people are um have chosen their work find joy in it and every time they solve a problem new questions arise they think about it they are uh, involved in it intensely in the world, open to it. And as Dewey, Dewey would say, they're both doing and undergoing, exchanging, learning. And inspiration arises, as she says, 
from not knowing. She keeps saying not knowing. This is a woman who lived under uh, dictatorship, as you know, and then lived on the other side. But maybe you don't know it. You don't know her dates. <laughs> she died in 2000 and I'm going to say 12, something like that. Born in 23. Um, so she lived through the change. Um, and one of the things she learned is that we must not think we're certain. That certainty is dead, deadly. Um, I will end with that. It comes finally, I think, to, if I put it in a slogan, which I don't like to do, but anyhow, it's in my book and it's one of the red threads. And I want it next to all of that being appropriate, being open, being present to reality, not submitting to it. We have to comprehend it, which is a form of resistance, Arendt says, even a reality, comprehension. We don't just take it. We think about it. Um, one of the threads in my book, finally, was people who are not thinking are capable of anything because they're not thinking about what they're doing. They can do it. I learned to smash ants when I was a kid. I, I learned to do these things, not to think about it. There are a lot of things we can learn to do and then just not think about it anymore. And then when things are okay in the world, things are okay. But the world isn't always going to be okay. So we look to our thinkers who are drawn out when things are going bad. And that's when we need the most, not least. Thank you. Um, we, I think, uh, Thomas, can we just have an open... Um, uh, unmute everyone. Yeah, I can. Um, I think some of us are unmuted. Yeah, I, uh, so as anyone who, who can speak, um, say have a, a question, a place where they would like to start. I know it's complicated, but to go ahead. Observations are fine. Yeah. What comes to my mind is how all of this plays the ideological division because people are perhaps comfortable not not thinking for themselves critically but accepting a leadership with slogans and uh, that's kind of what I was thinking about how people reacted to the vaccine or to mask masking and sort of chose sides in a very ideological way yeah. yeah, when things um, are threat it's threatening to fall apart, um, you know, when things are difficult and we can't ha having trouble making sense of them, um, it's a very comforting thing for those who find it comforting. I find it claustrophobic, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> to move inside, of course, to have a, a closed way of thought. Uh, one of Hannah Arendt's definition of ideology was <laughs> an ideology is a framework of thought or a theory that cannot be questioned because your question is immediately interpreted within it. Uh, she didn't like Freudianism very much, so she used that as an example. And she said, for example, you say to a Freudian, we could say, a, you know, an ideological Freudian to leave all the others out of this. <laughs> she said, you say to a Freudian, you know, I like everything, you know, I you know, I follow what you're saying, but you know, I, I really don't know what to do with this business about, you know, uh, the Oedipus complex. And the Freudian has, will look at you and say, oh really, that's very interesting. Why do you think that is? And you've just walked right into it what they do they're going to now deal with it from within the theory uh marxists can do the same thing all of us can do that if we get into our motive we get into our motive thinking so sure it's an 
I, I took to calling them sort of generically enclosures of thought. Um, it's not necessarily easier, incidentally. I mean, you can work very hard on these and they can be very complex, um, but they're closed. That's what worries me. Another one of the lines from my book that sort of kept coming to me, and so I just kept putting it in there, um, was we need to be able to be startled back into thought. We're often on autopilot. We need to be. You can't get through life being attentive all the time. <laughs> We'd wear out. Um, but we need to be able to be startled back into thought. And if you're smack within an ideology, whatever comes along, you interpret from within. Like that's not a new fact. I don't have to adjust. That's a lie. That's politicizing. That's something like that. I suppose we think that we're thinking all the time, but we really aren't always. And, you know, this is some of the ways to, to look at it a little bit and say, well, how do I make that a little bit more in depth? Well, we are using our minds quite often, not all the time. I mean, in the sense that we're, you know, kind of autopilot, we get through our days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have to, <clears throat> we have to do that, of course. And, and sometimes <clears throat> we're definitely using our minds. We're really, we're using some skill. We've got, you know, reasoning, analyzing, doing things we know how to do. That's all highly active and, and, and the small T thinking, however wonderful it is, I don't mean to diminish it by, by making it small T. I'm just trying to make a distinction. Mm -hmm. But it, with, with all of those, what I've come to think, and that's what thought work is about, this collection of papers by people from many different fields. Um, I, I asked them, Michael and I asked them, are there ways of thinking within your field that you think help protect us against um, extensive evils and might serve extensive goods? Good. Within the thinking of the field, its own logics and so forth. And they wrote papers responding hmm. to that. Which I thought I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Pe people keep telling me, Elizabeth, nobody knows how to read that book. <laughs> it's a very peculiar book. So yes, I quite like it. <laughs> because no matter what field you're in, no matter how we're thinking, I as you know for sure by now, I think it's crucial that we think about it and watch, pay attention to what it does when we act on it in the world and so forth. So we are using our minds, but we may we may not not but being reflexive, reflective. We should be good. If anybody wants to wants to speak or wants to, to chime in here, uh, feel free. If you speak loud enough, I think they should be able to hear us just fine. Yes, absolutely. I mean, people can take, can unmute themselves. Elizabeth, would you... Um, speak um, a bit more about, hmm, I want to say examples of the banality of good. Well, I can give you a, unfortunately, there are a fair number of examples of extensive banality of good. For example, the Indian schools. Oh, okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Right. We've Thank been... you. <laughs> like, hello, wake up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and some missionaries, by no means all, but some. Um, they had homes for, oh dear, I knew that would happen. They had homes for wayward girls. Um, and as you know, they found bodies behind some of those now. So I think those are those are classic. Mm -hmm. examples um and, and then small i mean sort of like the the um the extensive uh banal extensive banalities of good on a you know kind of uh what a, a personal intensive um, of intensive small scale intensive well intensive or yeah although I, I guess i was looking at it as you can work with um, and an extensive 
number of um, jobs acts with evil, what are they? Um, I mean, you've given, uh, well, I guess you've given some of the Indian schools, you've given, um, maybe I think of having been raised Catholic, you know, all of the good the nuns did, but it was all the, all the evil they were doing under the guise of good. Mm -hmm. Almost Is any, that... no. I, I, I also would, I, let me just say this so I don't work wake up in the middle of the night and worry about yeah. <laughs> being <clears throat> being a brooder myself if anybody doesn't know what the indian schools were let us know because that could sound awful <laughs> as you say these are the schools who were set up to civilize indians and the children were kidnapped based stolen taken away taken to these schools not allowed to speak their language put in different clothes etc in order to civilize them and one of the key lines that came out time and again amongst those like who were raising money for these schools and promoting them was you have to kill the Indian to save the man. So that was a kind of cultural, culture side. Um, and, and people, the children, of course, died and they were separated from their families radically. Again, again, this has happened time, time and again, that the children are taken away in order to raise them separately. Of course, they were also saved some from the Holocaust by being you know, the child care things where they took children to England who were saved and raised. And we've read about them too. That was an act of good. So I was gonna be uncomfortable if I just let that <laughs> sitting there. Um, and then I'm sure every one of us can think of um, things that we've, done where our intentions were all good but somehow or other we weren't paying adequate I just mean we were mistaken I don't think I'm not we can't be responsible for everything in the whole world <laughs> this is not there are things where we could have paid attention um, and heard a little bit more listened to the context a little more um, and we might not have done what we did I had a friend speaking of children I had a been actually somebody who I worked with for a PhD in this fascinating program from which I learned more than anybody I ever worked with it was wonderful this was a um, a woman who was getting her PhD um, in child psychology and social work both because she'd been working with child protection agencies and so forth um, and she had seen children taken away uh, it, it, sometimes in situations that broke her heart that she thought were not necessary. Sometimes she thought they were necessary. But that haunted her enough that she wanted to be able to speak about it. And she wanted some, she wanted authority in the world to speak about it. Because when she testified it, you know, in some of these cases, nobody would listen to her. Because she didn't have any degrees. Um, I'm sure a fair number of those of the people who were working in the child protection meant well. Some didn't, some didn't, but I'm sure a fair number did. Um, and the question is, are we being attentive enough? And thinking and being willing to learn. I like that from Dewey too, not just attentive. There's something to learn from all of those. A current issue that uh, I am encountering uh, in my religion, which is Unitarian Universalist, uh, very liberal. Our, our fellow religionists have, have died during the um, struggle for civil rights. And yet, um, currently, there is an accusation that the organization is um, a white supremacist. And uh, for many of us, that's shocking. Um, when you look at the history of some churches and the funding and the behavior that is present, the question is in the current iteration of the religion, are we white supremacist? And should we be judged accountably by others? 
on whether or not we are fighting for more rights for the oppressed, the racially oppressed particularly. And um, this is a, a big conundrum for many of us because we, we don't feel we've lived our lives as white supremacists. And yet this accusation is coming kind of ideologically. And if you protest it, then you're being defined as white supremacist. It's like you can't, um, there's no flexibility there in thinking about it from the people who feel they're so oppressed that they want to be heard above all. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. And maybe this is an example people can take with them and uh, think about further. I just bring it up because I think it's a, a very puzzling conundrum to figure your way out of. Mm -hmm. Of course it is in many ways and it reminds me of um also in the uh, in civil rights earlier in the 60s and um actually late 50s i was involved my family was in, involved and then it you know time and again time and again i was in situations in which i, I just decided I, I need what i need to do is just be quiet that's fine. It's time for other people to speak. You know, people who would try and white people who would try and speak would be met with all kinds of anger and frustration and you know name calling and so forth. At that point, I decided, okay, that's that's fine. People, other people can speak. It's not my turn. However, I will now say <laughs> that with this present manifestation, um, where it comes from, all sorts of people not necessarily those who have indeed been silenced and so forth. Um, I think there's a lot of ideology out there. It's a, You're not supposed to say that. Uh, it's very worrisome, but I've been saying to people, I think there's, a, there's education about these issues and how we, we should think about them and act about, uh, about them. We do need to work on our minds, as I was saying, because these meanings are in there. We're, we're all implicated one way or another. Things come out of our mouths. Things are, you know, they're there. Um, I think that a lot of people have been trained. I went to some of those trainings. And you're given definitions. This is what this is. And this is what this is. And this is what this is. And you have to call it every time. It has nothing to do with listening, learning, hearing this person, context, history has nothing to do with that, it has to do with um, applying what you were trained to somebody. I find that appalling. I do not think that's helpful. And I don't think that's going to, I don't think that's going to occur. Anyhow, to add to that, white supremacy is something very specific. If we start using it for everything, we've lost its meaning. I would prefer more distinctions. I don't mind at all being said, you know, be, what whiteness is constructed as is a very complicated thing, mostly not very nice in the whole situation. And I've done work, many people have done a lot of work on that, much more than I have, so forth. Um, white supremacy, I was just trying to write about this the other day, is something very particular. And it, I think we need that category. I think it uh, stops thinking to start using it as a label in all kinds of contexts. That's the our, end of thinking. Our minister gave a very thoughtful uh, sermon and his term was white privilege and to be more deeply aware of our white privilege. And that made a lot of good sense to me of, of being able to walk through the world without being accused at every moment or people being suspicious of you at every moment. Um, and I, I think that white privilege is uh, deeply educational, that term, uh, as opposed to white supremacy. Yeah, white supremacy is very particular. If we, um, Peggy McIntosh and I were working many, many, many years ago. Would you, did you read her piece about the knapsack of white privilege? Amazing. Okay. It's all over the place. It's very useful. She's a white woman, pr very privileged white woman actually, <laughs> who um, umpteen years ago, 
I could be 50. I don't know. Uh, we were working in women's studies and what on earth is that? Um, feminism in relation to scholarship and inclusive, inclusive meanings and so forth. And somebody said something to Peggy about white privilege because we were a diverse group. <laughs> and Peggy thought, she said, I'm not aware of having any particular privilege because I'm white. So then she started paying attention. And she ends up with these very useful, just what you were saying. She, I mean, back then it was, you know, I can buy band-aids that do match my skin color, right? I can buy dolls that look like me. I can, and you know, she, all, all of those things, a whole list of things that from tiny, that that's attentiveness. It's, a, it's I, that this piece has been so useful to so many people without clanking theorizing or anything of the sort just pay attention to this um it's been enormously useful to people and sort of you know wake, waking us up um it's a nice example it's a nice example of thinking i think it's uh, peggy mcintosh uh, she's published the paper and oh well just google it you'll find it you'll find lots of i, I just put her name up on the uh, uh, screen or on yeah. the, the chat so yeah. and uh, did you have, um, Elizabeth, I was doing doing two things at once, difficult. Um, a title of that article, was it an article or is it a book? Do you think? I think she's finally put these things together in a book. She doesn't like books. She likes to talk. And she's got this one paper that she gave over and over and over again, changing it every time, which is also the act of a thinker. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's, it's something about... An, I don't know if knapsack is in the title. Oh, no, there is. Yes, here's the that title probably. White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. Um, That's it. It's not hard to find because it's her work. That's it. This is what she's done. Wow. She's still doing it. Okay, yeah, it's, um, it's on. I'm, I picked it up on my phone, about three pages. Um, you know, what I say, two and a half, you know, mm -hmm. uh, three columns aside, but. So that's that's the key uh, the key article of her the work of her life. That's it. Yeah, I mean it's really it's really quite fascinating. Somebody challenged her, and she did exactly this. She said, "Oh, hmm, I don't know that. I wonder what that's about." And then she just started paying attention, and she started talking, and she started listening to people, and she started writing it, and she started speaking about it, and people would say things, and she would go back, and she would sort of re rework it and it never turned into you know a, pardon me but a clanking theory where you have fancy terms that you have to learn <laughs> um it stays there and accessible and so it, it doesn't do all the work we need a lot of stuff you know like critical race theory is quite fascinating and and very important and i wish the people who hate it would actually read it but i'm you know not likely <laughs> so forth. Um, I don't mean to say that that's all there is by any means. I mean, you need to be reading people of color, of course, of course. But to the specific, to a specific issue, it's it's a nice example of um, practicing reflexivity on who and how we are in the world with with others. Instead two, year, two years ago, uh, Brooke and Thomas presented a speaker who studied um, the history of the South in terms of um, women who tried to do the opposite, well, kind of do DeSantis on education, but before his time, uh, after the Civil War, to make sure that schools taught the Civil War as not about slavery at all, but about states' rights and uh, to the noble lost cause. Thank you. That's my husband chiming in there. He's um, staying over there. He, he's been listening uh, beside <laughs> me here. Hi, Eric. Um, <laughs> and um, I think that um, for me, this was a deeply eye-opening uh, presentation that has continued to resonate in my mind, understanding how important it was that every school taught the right frame of mind about the Civil War, mm -hmm. and how that raised generations of 
who couldn't see the reality of it because of the layer of ideology that had been painted over it. And Brooke, I thank you and Tom much for bringing us that speaker. You probably remember yeah. her name. Yes, um, it is Elizabeth McRae, M-C-R-A-E. Yeah. And, uh, she's currently, um, oh gosh, what is she? She's currently looking at the role of white women in uh, Moms for Liberty. And oh, that's- Oh my so goodness. Yeah, but she was, you know, looking at what she talked with us about back then, right, was the role of white women in, um, the men were out being KKK members and what were the women doing? And so um, she, you know, what was their role? And and now- and How I'm, scarily effective they were. Yes. How yeah, right yeah. they were in their effectiveness. Yeah, right. and, and, and that has just been a huge, um, it keeps resonating with me in my thoughts when I hear DeSantis or people who support his attempts to to use CRT, critical race theory, as a way of, of just shutting down any real history. Mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah, true. you know, you, it might be interesting, there's a new, I'll have to send it to you, Brooke. There's a new book that won a national award, um, this year or maybe last year about um, Carter C.G. Woodson, from whom that quote about lynching came, that is was a great black educator back a ways, who's talking about the development of um, black education in the U.S. It's a, uh, he's very readable himself, Woodson. Mm -hmm. His main book is called The Miseducation of the Negro. That's as I said, it's back a ways. Yeah. Um, and as I said, there's a new book about him that places it in context. A new book about Woodson? Yes, it's about Woodson. It, there's a guy talking about, he's a very, very interesting scholar who's talking about um, education and struggles for black education and, you know, segregation, integration, but not along the lines we're used to. The, how control was exercised over black education. Uh, All kinds of things, of course, not to be talked about in the black schools. I mean, they talk about things like the teachers in the black schools would have the, the book they were supposed to teach on the desk because the white boards and principals and so forth would show up regularly to check them. So they'd have that on the desk and it would be on the students' lesson plans. On their lap under the desk, they would have C.G. Woodson's curriculum. <laughs> talking about no actually there is a whole other culture and other meanings and other ways to think about it it's a wonderful story of of on the one hand laying out the incredible efforts saying you know to control no you must not and this is black people must not know um white people must not know either because it makes us feel bad i guess so much <laughs> anyhow <laughs> um but he also developed curricula which means, you know, knowledge that people didn't have, uh, didn't know was available. There, there are always people out there doing this scholarship. Always have been, you know? And when they told us there were no women philosophers, there were no women this, it's true, not true. We find it, we bring it back. Um, and Woodson, with regard to education, and uh, it is really one of, the, one of the best. I was delighted that this guy wrote, wrote a book bringing him back. I'll um, do so. I couldn't get it quickly. Um, I just did a, a quick Google and it was not not specific enough. So it brought up a whole bunch of Woodson's. Um, oh. but I'll do it and then put it in the um, in the chat for people to take a look at later. Okay, um, good. Thank you. And I'll get the name. Jarvis is the name of the author. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. That'll be his new book. Oh, unless that's his first name. Oh, Christ. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll right. get it to you. I'll get it to you. <laughs> okay, all right. Jarvis is his first name. All right, I might be a while. Um, but um, uh, there, is there sort of another kind of burning question? And then we'll um, thank Elizabeth very much for tonight and for stirring our pot to think, <laughs> um, if you will. Um, I can say it that way. Um, one of the things that I always find 
is um, how attentive you know, I am when we do think about our thinking and right. how exhausting it also is. Yes. You know, that we don't, we're not there um, enough, you know, as, and, and there are just little things. I mean, I want to say before you go, um, before we all go is, I mean, just a little phrase of, of so-and-so meant well, you know, when you were talking about, uh, you know, among the others, you know, well-intentioned people, um, but how, when, especially if, you know, let's say if I'm with um, brothers and their kids and grandkids, you know, and somebody feels, and rightly so, um, abused or whatever from a respected adult, you know, and the parent or grandparent goes, well, you know, he meant well. And the child is never recognized for the injury that did happen to them. Mm -hmm. The parent or the adult is trying to protect <laughs> for what reason? Mm -hmm. you know, under this guise of respect your elders, maybe. Mm -hmm. When that, does that teach you? you know, mm -hmm. I suppose it flashes in my head, it teaches you from a very young age um, not to think. I'm going to stop. You know, I won't. I must be wrong or something rather, whatever, you know, whatever else happens. That's anyway. Um, well, there certainly are reasons why it's difficult to take up. Uh, you know, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time now, and I know it's very difficult. And what that says, because we have minds and children come to us using them and wide open and asking all kinds of questions and so forth. What it says is that that's one of the ways of thinking that gets shut down, just as you were exactly mm -hmm. saying. Um, we don't encourage throughout education, some wonderful education does. None of these statements hold across all lines. I'm very glad to say, <laughs> um, of course, but I've had, uh, I had a class at one point, which I, we'd been going for, I don't know, a month or something like that. And I asked a question and there was a long silence. And I said, I'm okay with that. You know, so we sat for a while. And then I said, it was a terrible question. I can ask another question because sometimes you ask a terrible question. <laughs> People teach you to teach all the time, right? Because they say, oh, I can't do that. And one of the young women said, no, no. Oh, she said, Elizabeth, she said, it's just, we're not used to this. And I said, what aren't you used to? And she said, well, we're not used to having somebody keep asking us one question after another, rather than just looking for an answer. I call those popcorn classes. You know, you ask a question, you get an answer. You ask another question, you get an answer. You don't say, and tell me more. What does that mean? You know, question, the kind, they come, you don't draw out the meaning. Um, she said, we don't talk about what things mean in classes, and it's just worn us out. She said, I think we're worn out. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, I understand that. We don't spend enough time unfolding and saying, yeah, but what, did, what does that mean? And that's a practice of reflexivity. Yeah, and I'm thinking here right now is when you... Um when you were talking about that is you asked for, you know, th this certain kind of having people in your view where you could really talk to them or feel like it anyway, um, is that what you wanted was to be able to have an authentically present um, conversation. Mm -hmm. And when that's what my, what popped in my mind when you were talking about this, the woman whose response was, we're not used to. Um, really somebody being really being attentive to you not used to somebody being attentive to her response no right it's even scary to people often very that's the word that came in my mind earlier and then popped out yes it yeah. is frightening it's very it, 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 it i mean vulnerability which is what when we're really seeing stirs up in us 
And that's frightening to be really seen and heard. And we need it and we crave it. And then we try and get it in other ways, which don't answer the need. Like fame or stuff that's admired or, you know, all kinds of external things. We're trying to be seen and recognized. And when we have a chance to actually be, we don't really know how to do it. I think that's it's, it goes everywhere from child rearing to how we are with each other, with our friends, certainly to education. It breaks my heart that we don't do more of it. And I love the schools where it is done. It's so wonderful to see. And there are, there are some, she said. <laughs> I wish they could, I wish people would refer to them more, you know, and learn. Yeah. I uh, say. Well, okay. Well, the, um, Elizabeth, thank you. Um, I'm glad that people got to experience who you are. Um, you're, um, it is really, it is, I have to say, um, and it's, it is magnificent and it's a holy thing to be in your presence because you are so present. Oh, so thank you. Thank Liz, you. Get, thank you, Brooke. And thank, thank you. Oh, it's good to be asked and to have a chance to think it through again and hear how it's changing as we work. It does. And I'm sorry we're not together physically because that's so much better, but it's wonderful to be able to do it. This is a wonderful thing, as Brooke was saying. So thank you. Absolutely. And and for those here um, on Thursday, uh, we will you know come back to the same spot, the same location, and we can you know, talk about what the experience was, questions we might have, if you've done any other, you know, um, what thinking or reading or something, bring that to um, the conversation. So, um, and we'll see how all of that goes. And it's an experiment. I don't know of a, of a, uh, a lecture series that has ever sort of had a- That's great. You know, yeah, a conversation, a place where people could, can, what really get in there and ask questions and not it, it, it's it's a it's a dialogue it needs to be a collaboration so and what we're going to collab start collaborating about is what you have brought to us you know and then what can we what do we what how do we take it to another level and perhaps maybe sometime also then to have you come back you know that's another spin out of this we have no idea so but thank you elizabeth and thank you all for coming um, tonight, and we hope to see you next week, a week Thursday. So, all right. Good night. <laughs>